Hello, I'm a cultural and a theatre historian by the name of Julia. I recently crossed the floor from Cambridge University Education Faculty to Anglia Ruskin University English Department. Um, that's meaningful in that uh, the politics of that transition uh, relate to why I came to Cambridge in the first place, which was a very interesting debate at Jesus College um, uh, 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 in relation to which I became a member um, uh, about the relationship between these very issues. That is, uh, which started in many ways from the premise that there is a class inequality enshrined in culture. That was the basis of it. And it influenced many discussions at the time about dis the discipline of English and, just as importantly, the nature of access of study to uh, subjects in the arts and humanities and whether new co cohorts of students should be embraced by a changing curriculum and a radicalizing curriculum which matched with their experience and an ever the long revolution, if you like, of the curriculum to match with the experience of widening participation from new groups of students um, from the post-war period onwards, as, as we've heard analysed. One of the advantages of going last is that uh, other speakers have made a lot of important arguments already about the politics of this, the philosophy of this, the theatre of this, very important part of this. So that enables me to focus on two issues, the new universities and women, girls and women. What I'd like to say about girls and women is this. Our future um, social and political opportunities have often rested on access to the study of the arts and humanities. I think Pete's absolutely right. This isn't to create a division with science, far from it. Despite some efforts to encourage girls and women to apply to study STEM subjects more widely, these disciplinary zones have often tended to operate more exclusionary practices not always engaging rigorously with questions of system, infrastructure, and existing cultures. If the arts and humanities are endangered, endangered species, so is the future of girls' and women's education in this country. I think it's worth thought. But it has to be part of a broader <coughs> argument. It can't, as with the new universities, we can't be marginalised again. It shouldn't need a new women's movement. It's part of the larger argument, as is the argument about the new universities. The new universities now, um, Michael's quite right about vocational training and so on, and the problematic evolution of the new, new universities. But now, I believe, it's arts and humanities that may maintain the balance with vocational training and science in the new universities. You know, it's an equilibrium. If arts and humanities go from the new universities, the new universities will not survive. Okay, now it's up to people here to make this as a generic argument. Again, you know, we can't make, we can't marginalize, I don't believe, you know, teaching in both universities, we can't marginalize the new universities in this argument because, this is what I'd like to finish with really, is that um, it un undermines the credibility of the entire sector if we do. It undermines the credibility of higher education in this country if we do not art articulate a common cause. And a lot of people have, of course have been doing this this morning and know this. Um, so the integrity of the, the entire, as well as the politics and economics, the integrity of the entire sector is at stake in this, unless we do this. Uh, and in a way, as, as many people have already brilliantly said, uh, this is, I can say this simply now after a morning like this, because the political argument has become absolutely obvious to us, hasn't it? That if we don't do this, we will revert to versions of elitist and exclusionary understanding and practices of culture, which will discriminate against the vast majority of this 
of the population. Uh, I was trying to come up with a neat and tidy idea about how far, far back in history and culture this would go. And I actually think it's further back than the 19th century, what we're talking about. Uh, in terms of the relationship between post-school education and, and culture. I think it goes further back than the 19th century, um, put in that, those rather simplistic terms. Uh, the new universities represent um, an extension of the principle of comprehensive education beyond schooling. That, that to put it simply. Um, they cannot afford financially or politically to sacrifice this principle or the concomitant practices which have grown up with it, which have accompanied the growth of higher education, particularly over the last 15 years. Uh, the crisis in the arts and humanities may well turn out to be about the very survival of new universities, as, have, as I've said. Um, and that, uh, you know, these, of course, these arguments are politically integrated too. The expansion um, in terms of class and gender and, and um, racial, ethnic groups, the, uh, the, the argument is coherent of a piece. The easiest argument to, to make is to defend the arts and humanities in the Russell group. That's the easiest argument to make. The most difficult argument to make is a defense of arts and humanities in relation to student participation in the sector as a whole. And I think before Leo shows me the red card, I will probably leave the field. But I, I wanted to just in, invert that wonderful image um, from earlier this morning. And I've asked permission for this cita citation. And hit you with my rhythm stick. <laughs> Please don't get out of step with new universities in whatever argument you make. Thank you. Thank you.